Welcome everyone, thank you for coming to the celebration of Little Shop of Horrors, magazine number 38, devoted to Frankenstein, the true story. Uh, I've been a fan of Frankenstein, the true story, ever since it was first broadcast on NBC TV in two parts, in prime time, in 1973. The scope of the movie was epic. It had the highest budget of any made-for-television movie up to that time and the highest budget of any horror film up to then. But let's be clear about something right now. The title of the film was intended to be Dr. Frankenstein. That's what the writers called it, that's what Universal called it throughout its development, and it was shot under that title. A few weeks before broadcast, NBC TV decided to change the name to Frankenstein, The True Story, which frankly was ludicrous. There's nothing true about it, and it was certainly not faithful or true to the Mary Shelley novel. This movie was a seminal influence on an entire generation of writers and directors, myself included. For instance, immediately upon seeing the film, Anne Rice was directly inspired to write Interview with a Vampire. Mark Gatiss, the co-creator and co-producer of Sherlock, who also plays Mycroft Holmes in that series, is another fan who contributed an essay called Queer Frankenstein, examining the gay subtext of the film. The great Oscar-nominated filmmaker Guillermo del Toro of Pan's Labyrinth fame recently put Frankenstein the True Story on his top 100 favorite films of all time list, calling it quirky, brilliant, and moving. So, why is this film so often ignored and forgotten? It's my mission to rectify that injustice and to present for the very first time anywhere a detailed analysis of the making of this groundbreaking ground ground milestone with over 20 brand new interviews of cast and crew including Leonard Whiting, Jane Seymour, David McCallum, and co-writer Don Bacardi. First, we have Denise Millay, who is the widow of the great musician Gil Millay, who composed the brilliant orchestral score to Frankenstein, The True Story. <laughs> After a successful career as a jazz and electronic musician, Gil started writing music for television programs at Universal in the 1960s. He composed the memorable electronic theme to Rod Serling's The Night Gallery, and eventually got his first theatrical motion picture assignment composing the electronic score to the Andromeda Strain, for which he was nominated for a Golden Globe Award. Gill actually designed and built his own electronic instruments and recording studio for that groundbreaking endeavor. For Frankenstein, The True Story, Denise accompanied Gill to London for the duration of composing and recording the score with the London Symphony Orchestra. So she has some very interesting stories she's gonna share with us a, a little bit later. Um, next we have Julian Barnes, who appears in Frankenstein, The True Story. <laughs> Julian also starred in such films as Horror House with Frankie Avalon, The Ballad of Tam Lin with Ava Gardner, directed by Roddy McDowell, and more recently, Julian has appeared in Joe Johnston's The Rocketeer, Tim Burton's Mars Attacks, and Guillermo del Toro's Pacific Rim. <laughs> and we also have with us the legendary artist, Bruce Tim. He painted this gorgeous inside cover foldout of the Arctic climax and finale to the movie. And you'll see the original out in the gallery. Uh, Bruce is an artist, character designer, animator, writer, producer, and actor. He's best known for his contributions building the modern DC Comics animated franchise known as the DC Animated Universe. Bruce co-created and co-produced the Emmy Award-winning Batman the Animated Series and its various spin-offs. 
Superman the Animated Series, and Static Shock. He was the sole creator and producer of the animated series Justice League and Green Lantern. He also produced the feature links Batman Beyond Return of the Joker. Woo! <laughs> And I think it's significant that just prior to Frankenstein, the true story, Gil Millay had composed the Emmy and Golden Globe winning TV movie, That Certain Summer, considered the very first sympathetic portrayal of a gay couple on network television, played so memorably by Martin Sheen and Hal Holbrook. Gil's compassion and sensitivity in writing the scores to both of these films is extraordinary. So Denise, um, let's go back and tell us what you recall about uh, Gil getting involved in this movie. How did he get the, how did he get the job? Well, um, I don't know that Sid Sheinberg, who was head of television at the time. Head of, head really of, uh, head of wanted, television yeah. at Universal. Yes, I don't think he particularly wanted Gil, thought about him. And they wanted Maurice Shaw and, or Michelle Legrand and neither of them wanted to do television in those days. And uh, I guess skill was the other choice. The head of production was an, a man named George Santoro, and he really plugged um, to get Gil to do the score. And Hunt, I don't think, was familiar with Gil's music, but he was open to George Santora's suggestion, and I guess he got approval from Sid Sheinberg, so that's yes. how it all happened. There was one story that uh, I thought was interesting where you told me that Hunt Stromberg Jr., the producer of the movie, wanted to get, to, wanted to hear a sample of what Gil yes, was up right. to. That's right. So that's tell us about that. Yes, um, actually he left Gil alone, which was great because Gil was one of those people who didn't like to be pressured and give samples of, of his music, like a lot of producers or directors would want to hear something beforehand. And then one day Hunt said, gee, I'd like to hear something that you've written. And Gil wrote what I thought was one of the most beautiful themes for the movie, and that was the creation of Prima, where he used the harp. And I don't know if you're going to show that. That's our next of the movie. clip. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you you, you, you uh, led into it beautifully, yeah, darling. And, uh, <laughs> and Hunt was sold on it. He just loved it. But uh, I have to say that Hunt basically left Gil alone. To after all, you hire a person for, you know, the talents that they have, and you don't have to prove yourself, you know. And Hunt gave, you know, Gil that credit. He, he hired him and he expected him to do the best that he could. Yes. Oh, that's great. <laughs> it was not a huge role, but I certainly enjoyed what I did. And uh, as I think I told you, one of the more memorable moments was uh, James Mason. May I tell that story? Please. <laughs> It was right at the height of the Watergate scandal. <laughs> and between setups uh, in the ballroom uh, sequence, there'd be this circle of astonishing talent, uh, all listening to James Mason read from, as I recall, the Herald Tribune, but it might have been the Times, every day between takes, he would read the update of the Watergate scandal in his... <laughs> <laughs> To, to, the pres to the cast who were present and in his inimitable voice. Yeah, it was just uh, one of those memories that'll stay with me forever. I, I, I get to you clearly, clearly has. <laughs> yes. And interestingly enough, there are, I've talked to a number of people who worked on the film who began to think that maybe he was basing a little bit of his performance of Dr. Polidori on Richard Nixon. So <laughs> there is a connection. May I just add a little bit to that? Please. That entrance, you know, Margaret Leighton, God bless her, a legend, uh, was uh, somewhat frail. And so I took it upon myself to just make sure, uh, and I've been quite, I'm quite good at this in both stage and screen, at being a rock. You know, if somebody's 
uh, nervous or unhappy with uh, this, whatever situation arises uh, in some of the jobs I've done. I just try to be there for them as much as I can. And that was one of my chief concerns with uh, having Margaret Leighton on my arm. And of course, Michael Wilding as, uh, was on the picture and he would always come over and say, And they were married at the time. Are you yes. all right, dear? Mm -hmm. You know, and make sure that she was, uh, she was doing okay. It's yes. just a nice touching moment. No, that's fantastic. I, I love her so much. Um, I believe that Stromberg not only wanted to expand Margaret Layton's role, he wanted to expand yours too. And I think that's why he put the two of you together in that moment. Um, did you get that impression that he had a little bit of a uh, crush on you, Julian? Um, <laughs> <laughs> You'll see a very different Julian Barnes in a few minutes. <laughs> I was unaware. <laughs> you are mainly known for your caricature style artwork. But for Frankenstein, the true story, you decided to go in an entirely different direction. And you want to tell us about that? Yeah. Um, I, I've been doing stuff for, uh, for Dick Clemenson's uh, magazine for, God, it's been 15, 15 years, maybe. Um, and he'll just email me and say, oh, yeah, we're doing an issue on, uh, you know, on, on this particular movie or whatever. And I'll just go, oh, yeah, I like that movie. I'll, I can do something with that. Um, and in the past, it's always been, like you said, usually like kind of caricatures or portraits of, of, of the cast, um, and when I sat down to actually do something for the, for this issue, um, it just wasn't I wasn't feeling it. And then also I kind of had the feeling that a lot of the other artists that he he had contacted would would be doing like portraits of the the, the cast, and that turned out to be true. Um, and uh, so then I thought, okay, well, what am I going to do? And the deadline's approaching, and it's a it's a it's a fold out. It's a you know widescreen kind of frame thing rather than a a regular you know upright rectangle. It's a sideways rectangle, horizontal. And I was like, what am I gonna do, what am I gonna do? And then um, I was watching the movie again on YouTube. And, uh, and I, as we got to that sequence in the movie, it reminded me that um, even when I was a kid, when I first saw the movie, um, uh, when, it, when it first aired in 73, um, I remember thinking that the whole film had like this amazing epic feel to it, um, much, much unlike most of the, the TV productions at the time, it felt really big and 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 uh, like a, like a, like a movie. So much so that when I when I think of the movie, I think I tend to think of it in terms of it being like a widescreen picture. And when I get to that sequence in, in particular, the at the uh, at the Arctic, I'm always kind of I'm momentarily startled that the the image is square, that it's in the TV ratio rather than a, you know the 16 by 9 widescreen. And so that kind of gave me the idea. I said, oh. I've got this widescreen frame to draw in, and I, I've always seen this image in my head as being widescreen, so I'll, I'll do a version of that, and that's what I ended up doing. Well, you did a great job. Thank it was you. A, it's a very moving piece. <laughs> yes, well, there, uh, one of the scenes that was cut out, it was about a seven minute sequence uh, that opened the picture, and she starts to tell the story and their characters sort of morph and start to assume the characters of the, uh, the characters that are in the film itself. And it segues into uh, Dr. Frankenstein's brother, William, falling out of a rowboat and in the lake and drowning. And so that's the way the picture now opens, is the drowning of the brother. Which, and it's a l the editing is a little abrupt because it wasn't planned to really be the opening that way. Um, that sequence exists somewhere, I hope. <laughs> uh, it's never been seen, but it must be buried in the Universal Vault somewhere. Um, my dream is to someday they will make a concerted effort to find that and, and restore that, at least as an extra or something. Why they cut out that prologue with Mary Shelley, and having directed a lot of movies for commercial television, um, the golden rule is that you got to grab your audience by the first commercial break. Or as soon as that commercial hits, people are going to channel surf, and if they find something more interesting, they're going to stick with it. And I think that the executives at NBC felt like seven minutes of Mary Shelley um, and people have tuned in to see a Frankenstein movie may not go over that well in middle America. So I think that, I, I'm guessing, but that's, I, I think, a, a reasonable assumption. What they replaced it with. Uh, by taking that out, I mean, originally, you know, the top-billed star is James Mason. 
and originally he would have been in the very opening scene as Polidori by Lake Geneva. By taking that out, his character now was not going to appear for the first time in the movie for a good 45 minutes or more. So um, they decided to do an introduction with James Mason as himself, where he uh, is walking through a, a cemetery and showing us the gravestone of Mary Shelley and explaining about the history, and then showing a lot of really enticing clips of the film and a lot of spoilers, too. I mean, my God, they practically gave away the We didn't care about stuff movie. like that back then. We didn't care. We didn't care. Spoilers. It was like, no, look, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a crawling hand. That's right. <laughs> I know. I mean, I it was like... That. It was like, whoa, this is uh, going to be so incredible. So, after, you know, there's no way that viewers would not have stuck with it, seeing that montage of clips, because it was, it was really mind-blowing. Well, the great makeup artist Roy Ashton, that was his real arm, and he really did act out that moment. And he cast his own arm for the mold to make the fake arm. And so he had shaved all of the hair off of his arm, and so it was gonna be a perfect match anyway. So he, so it was, it was, that's how that all came about. He did the exterior of the arm, the, the skin and everything for the fake arm. And then uh, Colin Childers, who was in the effects department, did all of the mechanics inside. And he told me a funny story where they, it was so heavy on the floor, and the hand is supposed to like crawl along the floor. And when they first did it, the hand, the the fingers are just scratching on the floor. It can't pull it along because it's too heavy. So they put tiny little pins in the, f in the ends of the fingers so they could grip like ice picks so it could actually get traction and it really did pull it along. <laughs> And um, it's very, very, very frustrating that after all these years, this incredible score that I think is Gil Malay's, I think it's his best score, and that it has not actually officially come out on CD. And uh -huh. it is so beyond high time that this score is released. And Denise, you have the masters all perfectly preserved, I understand. Well, Use your microphone, but tell us. Oh, I'm sorry. They're real to real, and I don't know if Gil really had them put to digital. I'll have to take a look and see. Yeah. I think he did. But, uh, yeah, but we would, I'm hoping that the magazine will spur interest in, in those realms as well. Anybody who, who has taught in, any contact with soundtrack record labels, please put in a good word, and because and, uh, we would love for that to happen. I mean, they went through all the, you know, considering all of these m really major directors, but they were also very afraid. I mean, Fra when Francis Ford Coppola was campaigning to direct this movie, he had finished shooting The Godfather, but it hadn't come out yet. And no one knew whether it was going to be a hit. In fact, there was a lot of talk in Hollywood that it was a mess and that Brando was, you know, had to rely on cue cards and... So no one knew it was going to be a hit, and it took a number of months before it finally came out. And so as far as Universal was concerned, Francis Ward Coppola, eh, he's had some, some movies that didn't do very well. Finian's Rainbow, et cetera. He hasn't really had a, a big track record. And he went a million dollars over budget on The Godfather, <laughs> and they were being very pragmatic money-wise. They were very afraid that this was going to get out of hand. And... So, uh, long story short, because there are many other directors that were considered, they ended up going with a much more pragmatic choice. And Jack Smite was on contract with Universal, and he had done a number of, of big theatrical films in the 60s, Harper with Paul Newman, The Illustrated Man with Rod Steiger, and uh, many others. But he had signed a contract with Universal in 1969, this was 73, and he had done like literally like 10 or 10 TV movies in a row and had brought them all in on schedule and on budget and they had great confidence in him to be able to take on this huge enterprise and not go over budget and let it get out of hand. And then on the basis of this, he sort of uh, was springboarded back into theatrical films and Universal gave him Midway 
and Airport 70, yeah, Airport 75. <laughs> but, um, but he did get back into theatrical because of this movie. Wow. Wow. Wow.